Good afternoon, everybody, and uh, welcome to the first of the CDL Science Symposia for this semester. Um, once again, it is virtual, but hopefully this will be the last time it is virtual. Uh, we have seven speakers lined up through until mid-April. Um, you can go to our website if you haven't already done so and see the lineup. Um, just a quick reminder before we start uh, today that uh, you should use the chat function um, to ask questions. You can um, submit a question at any time during the course of the uh, talk, but I'll be moderating them at the end in the, the Q&A uh, period. So unlike the tradition that we know and love when we're doing these uh, events live, the speaker will not be irritatingly interrupted every 10 minutes. So it is my great pleasure uh, today to welcome uh, my uh, good friend and former colleague from UC Irvine, Dr. Craig Stark. Craig is uh, well known for his highly innovative work on uh, using fMRI to investigate uh, hippocampal pattern completion and associated processes in humans. And he's also well known for his role in the development of the mnemonic similarity test, which has become uh, very rapidly become uh, a mainstay in the cognitive aging uh, literature. Uh, today, he's going to be talking to us about old brains and new tricks. Can environmental enrichment improve aging memory? Without further ado, um, over to you, Craig. Well, thank you, Mick, and uh, thank you for that introduction and for the invitation to come on out again and chat with you, albeit be it virtually. I missed the chance to actually get to see you all in person, but this is what we can do. We can keep the science, uh, keep the science moving along. So my talk today is really going to be in two parts, and the messages, the sort of take homes that I hope you can actually get from this. Uh, first off is that our hippocampal memory system does decline with age, and this is part of why we lose our memory for details as we age. It's not the entire story. Of course, it's not the entire story, but it's at least part of the story. And the second part of the talk is going to be focused on what we may actually be able to do about this. And it's really going to be trying to see, can we exploit something that was developed extensively in the rodent literature, environmental enrichment, can we actually exploit that in uh, human research as well to try to see if that can improve hippocampal function and memory? OK, so bit of background. Now, most of you here are going to be from the uh, uh, CVL and know this kind of thing quite well. But just as the third of 30,000 foot overview, the kinds of things that happen to our memory as we age, um, one class of them can at least be characterized by things like, you know, you know I, I know I remember this happened, but but when was it? Or I know I read it, but where? I know I've seen her before and I know I've met her, but but who is she? I know I came home and I put my keys down, but where are they? So in each of these things, there's a key element of it in that there's a memory for the, you may want to call it gist, that seems perfectly fine, and yet there are issues with details. <clears throat> Now, we argue back and forth as researchers, of course, all day and year and decade as opposed to, is it really just in details? Is it associations versus, there are a lot of things, ways in which we've all gone and divvied this up, but this basic split seems to decidedly be out there. Now, again, I put up things here. This is in the talk for those few people who may not know where the hippocampus is, and also to show everybody what I would look like bald. Um, okay, yeah, a little. Okay, well, the hippocampus buried deep inside the brain. I can do fun 3D spinning brains. Come to a mid sagittal, come on out. And if you don't happen to know where the hippocampus is, it's buried deep inside. And so much for my animation. Nice setup and a total fail there. In any case, we call it the hippocampus because if you extract it, it looks like this. And you say to yourself, oh my gosh, that's a seahorse. All right. Um, at least it is if you stare at a whole heck of a lemon and you're doing nothing but staring at brains all day. What do we know about the hippocampus? Well, we know a lot about the hippocampus in terms of what it does for memory. Uh, we know that we argue back and forth a whole bunch about exactly how we want to divvy up the labor and try to say exactly what the hippocampus does versus the parahippocampal gyrus, et cetera, et cetera. 
But the framework that I've been working under for a number of years says that the hippocampus uses a concept, a computational concept called pattern separation. And it does this to let us rapidly store arbitrary associations. And this is what lets it really help us support rapidly learning new bits of detail in information. Basic idea on all of this is that similar events, similar information will have similar representations in the brain inside the hippocampus, the structure called the dentate gyrus in particular. The notion is that it pulls it apart into very different orthogonal representations so that you can use this as some way. And again, whether you want to think of an index, whether you want to think of some other form of code, it uses this in some way so that you can learn this new information, be able to change synapses rapidly without overwriting other information. We use pattern separation to reduce interference and therefore let it have a highly veridical, detail-based kind of memory quickly. Okay. Now, <clears throat> what do we actually, what do we know about how this system is changing with age? Well, there's been a huge amount of work that have been done for decades in the rodent that had been saying that there are things going on inside of the hippocampus associated with typical aging. When I first got into aging research, a whole heck of a lot of attention, rightfully so, was on frontal changes and even some parietal changes, et cetera. But there was a lot that was saying, oh, maybe the hippocampus itself isn't changing in typical aging, and maybe it's only changing in something like Alzheimer's disease. Well, in the rodent literature, it let folks really try to get at that. And the rodent literature was really highlighting some changes. So what we have here is a classic uh, place field kind of task. For those of you who may not know, you can uh, a place field is a or a place cell is just a cell in the hippocampus that responds when somebody is in or a rodent is in a particular location in space. The idea is it helps you in spatial memory, being able to remember where something is. So you could take a, a rat, put the rat in a box. And so here we have a little schematic diagram version of it. And this little toy example here, you have the rat. And whenever the rat is in sort of this location, this individual neuron in the CA3 of the hippocampus fires. There would be different neurons coding for different locations throughout the box. And again, with all of this, the idea is that it's helping support spatial memory. Cool, get you a Nobel Prize for discovering this kind of thing. One of the neat things about play cells is, well, if you take this same rat and you take this similar, you take this environment and you change it a little bit to say this circular environment, now many things are the same. You've taken the rat out of its home cage, you've dropped him in something else. There are these wires around, there are these things on the side, the same things in fact on the side, but it's a round box instead of a square box now. And so that place cell doesn't fire. Makes good sense. I'm in a different box. I'm not gonna be learning about the square room. I'm learning about the round room here. And so I'm not gonna fire. Okay, so the idea is we have a whole bunch of these and this is helping us store this memory. This, however, is what a young rat's hippocampus looks like. As the rat ages, this happens. Two key things on this. Biggest of the things is if you notice, here's a play cell in the square box and the play cell is firing again in the round room. It's as if, look, you took me out of my cage, you put me in the box, there's this weird black crowny thing or whatever on the side here, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's the same place I'm gonna fire. You have some of the gist, you've lost the details that, wait a minute, it's not just the square box, it's the round one as well. There is another little thing that comes up here that I sometimes point out, and that is that the place cells themselves tend to be much larger in older, uh, in older rats. Now, one of the great things about studying rodents is that rodents don't get, well, Alzheimer's disease, at least not the full-blown version of it. They may have some initial precursors to it, but we know that this is not from the big formation of plaques and tangles and a massive disruption of the hippocampus from that because that just doesn't happen unless you genetically modify them to do that. So researchers can go through and come up with not only a nice sort of schematic diagram, everything in the yellow here is the hippocampus, Blue is then the adjacent parahippocampal and perirhinal uh, cortices and entorhinal cortex, or the rodent postrhinal. Um, it's a basic schematic diagram of it. Yes, it does get more detailed than this, but the neat thing about this is that huge amount of research over decades has shown that some of these connections change with typical aging in rats and other ones don't. So everything in black doesn't seem to be changing. Everything in red does. This, by the way, isn't just the case in rats. It's been extensively uh, studied in rats and also in mice and also a whole bunch of non-human primate work. 
So we can see, for example, that coming out of the entorhinal cortex <clears throat> into the dentate gyrus, this thing, the perforant path, and also branching off into the CA3, you're cutting off a lot of the input into the hippocampus, or you're degrading that input. Also coming in through the fornix from the mammillary bodies, there are clear changes there. By the way, one of the ideas, remember that uh, elevated place cell activity in aging? Well, here, you're, what you're doing is you're inside of CA3, where those place cells were, you're releasing inhibition on those recurrent collaterals, and that actually leads to an elevation of this CA3 activity. And a whole bunch of work by people like Michaela Gallagher has been showing what happens when you pharmacologically go and alter this, bring it back down with drugs like levetiracetam and how that could be a treatment for MCI. Okay. So, but we know this is going on in animal models of aging, but the question is, what about us? And Mick said that I've had clever sort of experiments and all this kind of thing. The other way you can couch my career is saying, I mooch ideas off of the animal literature and just try asking if they apply to us. And sadly, that's like, I think the first principal component of my, uh, my research career here. I'll take it though. Okay, so Mick also mentioned this thing, the mnemonic similarity task. We're gonna need some way of trying to get at hippocampal function in humans. There are a lot of memory tests out there. This is one that we had designed a number of years ago, specifically trying to design a task within this framework of pattern separation and hippocampal function and <clears throat> the complementary learning system sort of hypothesis. Task works basically as follows. It's a pretty standard object recognition memory task. You have people study a series of objects we have them typically do an indoor-outdoor incidental encoding on them. Truth is, it doesn't matter. You can give people the in test instructions ahead of time. doesn't change the behavior at all. Then you go into a uh, test phase. And in the test phase, you have things that are real repetitions. You have things that are brand new. Okay, we're on an object recognition memory test right now. But you also have highly similar lore items. So we have our typical unrelated lores, like the rubber ducky here, and we have very similar lores. So this picnic basket is very similar to the studied one. This seahorse very similar to the studied one. And in the typical version of this task here, participants are supposed to say, is it an old item, a new item, or a similar but not exactly the same item? We have run two choice a bunch as well. Okay. What happens in all of this? How do I know that it's a hippocampal dependent task and all that kind of thing? Well, one way we can do that is we can test people who have anoxic damage to the hippocampus. And we know based on MRI, it's pretty limited to the hippocampus as far as we can get in, uh, um, in human work. Okay, so what you can see in the behavior of this, you have your hippocampal amnesics in red and you have your controls in uh, age match controls in green here. And you can see not much is going on in the classic object recognition. This little thing here, is this a reliable small deficit or is it no nothing at all? Spark about 20 years worth of people debating back and forth in the literature. We can sidestep this for right now to say if there is any kind of decrease in this, it's very small. Where you see a big decrease is right here. So if you are, if you had studied this seahorse and I test you with this one, <clears throat> your ability to successfully say, no, that's not exactly the same one, has gone way down. In fact, what you do is you say, yeah, 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 that's the seahorse you showed me. All right. Oh, if we test with these highly similar lore items, that's then when we see the real deficit with, uh, with hippocampal amnesics. Okay, so what happens in aging? Okay, well, when you take a look at the uh, sort of classic recognition memory or a sort of gist-based kind of thing, which you could do with the familiarity, uh, again, we can use whatever terms we feel like on here, uh, not a whole heck of a lot. This is, of course, a cross-sectional study. Um, but if we look cross-sectionally, they're really, here's the scatter plot up here. You're, okay, maybe there's a little bit of a drop, but it's not a gigantic thing to really be writing home about. By the time you've gotten into mild cognitive impairment, yeah, you're starting to have problems, even classic object recognition memory here, but not so much going on there. However, when it comes to this memory for the details, the discrimination sort of memory or the pattern separation-y based memory, there is a drop. Scatter plot up here, you can see it's a linear decline with age measured cross-sectionally. Uh, linear decline with age, as soon as we've started studying uh, your 18 year olds, it's all downhill from there. Sorry, everyone. Um, of course, is it actually flattening out by the time you're in your 70s and 80s? I can't really say. Uh, it's possible we're sort of banging into a little bit of a floor compression in effect here, but we also have the same challenge that everybody has in this, and that's a recruitment bias. 
if you're 85 and you can come on into this study, which involved three uh, hours of behavioral testing and three separate MRI sessions, you're doing pretty well. So um, yeah, I can't actually say that it sort of flattens out there. But what I can say is that there is a clear age effect on this. So in this task that we know is hippocampal dependent, that's starting to get at these details, that should be going on the dente gyrus because of that pattern separation, we see this. And that's at least cool. So, but can we tell a little bit tighter story than just that behavior? So I'm going to be turning first here to diffusion imaging. Um, diffusion weighted imaging to let us try to examine the connectivity and the microstructure of the brain. It lets us, of course, make really, really pretty pictures like this. Um, if you don't know much about diffusion, I'm going to try to give you the literal, uh, well, I guess this would probably be, I don't know, maybe about a 10,000 foot or 5,000 foot view of how diffusion imaging works. And I came up with this sort of, this visual, so I use it in all my talks, even though all of you probably know what it is, maybe you can swipe it as a good idea to try to explain to other people how the heck diffusion imaging works. The idea is as follows. Right now, this is a, a shot overhead of Southern California's freeways. Um, and you can see them because it's daytime. <clears throat> but let's say this were nighttime and you wanted to try to actually map out where the roadways were. Where, where are the highways? Where are the streets actually in this? Can I derive a map from this? And the answer is yeah. If you look over time, you could actually just look at where the cars are going. So for example, if I sort of zoom in on some little block right here and I try to quantify what direction cars are moving and maybe even how fast they're going, I would be able to come up with a couple of arrows like this <clears throat> because, well, look, yeah, we've got a highway going like this and we've got a little road or whatever going like that. And, and so if I just watch the traffic flow, I would be able to see something like that. I could pick another little spot here and I would be able to come up with traffic flows like this cars are moving along these pathways and I may not be able to see the pathways themselves, but if I can see the cars, I could actually then do something to try to derive where these pathways actually are. So I could derive a roadmap and just the analogy there is I could actually derive the connectome of the brain by trying to actually look at instead of how cars are moving around here, how water is moving around and our ability to move it around with an MRI scanner here, I can actually then derive that. More than that, however, I can actually do some manipulations on here. If there's an accident, that's going to change the traffic flow or even time of day changes the traffic flow here. OK, if there's a lesion, there's going to be something that would then be impeding or altering the diffusion of water molecules in the brain. So this analogy here we can then try to use as a way to understand what diffusion is doing and how it's working. All right, so some of the earlier work that we'd done, this is going back to about 2010. Um, this is work when uh, Mike Yasa was in my lab as a graduate student and then some follow-up work by Alana Bennett here. One of the things we wanted to see is could we actually get at that little perforant path and be able to actually see whether it's changing with age. Perforant path is a very, very challenging structure. It's a small little bit of fiber embedded in some massive fiber. So it's like the little on ramp there and the huge crossing sort of uh, freeways and we're trying to look at it. We got the resolution down and all this kind of thing. And I came up with an idea of trying to say, could we actually quantify the amount of diffusion in the assumed direction of the perforant path? Because we know the entorhinal cortex is down here, the hippocampus is up here, and we know that there's a perforant path that perforates through the subiculum here and into the hippocampus. So there should be something going in this direction. And if I just quantify how well things move in that direction, we got a nice little hot spot. We can see this kind of thing pretty much in everybody. And when you go and you take a little cross section of that hot spot, you can see that in fact, there was a change with age in that. All right, so there's a decline in age. There are a lot of declines in lots of sort of things in the brain with age. Is it tied to behavior? And the answer is yes. So in a whole series of studies in which we looked at the uh, um, perforant path, we looked at the fornix, uh, we could actually see in all of this that the hippocampal connectivity, this one actually is the fornix here, it looks prettier, um, is declining with age, even when you factor out global sort of changes in diffusivity in the brain. Not only that, actually the uh, tract FA, fractional anisotropy in these, uh, in these tracts here, once you factor out global FA, also correlated with your ability to do the memory task. 
So we can see that the underlying connectivity does show age-related changes and also is tied to memory performance. So that's pretty cool. But those techniques were based on diffusion tensor imaging, or DTI. And in DTI, just to remind you all, you're taking all of this jiggling water molecules in a lot of different directions, and you come up with a mathematical model centered around a tensor, a little three-dimensional ellipsoid, this little egg-shaped thing. And when all you have is an egg shape, it's going to be pretty difficult to model things, for example, crossing fibers. You're going to have a really, really difficult time doing that because it just turns into a blob because you don't have the richness to be able to get at something like that. Well, bright folks have come up with ways of moving beyond the tensor, and they form a sort of class of high angular resolution techniques, hardy style techniques that use multiple B shells in a lot of different directions to then go and let you actually have more complex mathematical models. And one of the models that we've been doing a lot with in the lab is called NODI, or Neurite Orientation Dispersion and Density Imaging. NODI does not let you do any kind of fun connectivity and make pretty pictures like this, which could be cooler than a picture like that, sure. But what NODI lets you do is it's, it's agnostic relative to the tissue type. So you can look in gray matter as well as white matter. And you can be trying to say for every voxel in the brain, I'm going to assume that it's built up out of several different types, several different compartments. There might be some free water, like a CSF kind of thing. And there may also they sometimes call them uh, hindered diffusion and constrained diffusion. Um, or ODI and NDI for, uh, for neurite density index. Now, I don't really like calling it the neurite density index. You're going to hear me just talk about NDI, but the idea is you come up with some ways that are trying to model intracellular diffusion, extracellular diffusion, and free diffusion, and this may give you a way in which you can at least interrogate how the system is changing with X. All right. We can come back to something like this. And the basic idea, though, is that the great thing about Nodi is it lets us zoom in on, it lets us look at the gray matter as well. Because within gray matter, there is structure. Look, think about your cortical columns. You have your neurons, they're oriented in a nice sheet, so the axons and everything are all lined up with each other. So we can think about those as sort of like, well, the roads within the suburbs here, within the residential areas. And when, if we were to zoom in on this, well, yeah, we could play that same trick and see where are the cars moving. Yeah, they're moving less, they're moving slower, all that kind of thing. There's less diffusion and all of that, sure, but they're still moving around. And if I did something like I bulldozed a couple million dollars for the properties here in SoCal, then the cars or the water molecules in my analogy here would be able to diffuse inside there. And so if there is something going on, loose analogy houses, pyramidal cell bodies or something like that, roads again, the axons and everything here within gray matter, we can see how we may be able to pick up on some changes in the underlying microstructure. All right, so obviously I wouldn't have gone through that setup with the cheesy animations if none of this actually worked. So here what I'm showing you on the left is the work of Anu Ventikesh. She's a, a really great graduate student in Lonnie Bennett's lab. Lonnie's now at UC Riverside. Um, and what Anu was able to show in a 2020 Neurobiology of Aging paper this year was that within the hippocampus, within the hippocampus itself, this neurite density, and uh, I'll just call it NDI, this NDI parameter here is changing. In fact, it, uh, it's increasing here with age. And what then uh, Hamzi uh, Radhakrishnan in my lab was able to show that this happens, this is relatively specific to the dentate CA3 subfield of the hippocampus. That this increase in NDI here, we're finding here even within a subfield level of the hippocampus. So again, this is now taking diffusion imaging from doing really, really cool tractography work or something like that to now being able to look at the microstructure inside of hippocampal subfields. So this came out in Frontiers in uh, aging research this year. Not only that, but we can do things like say, let's take the NDI inside the dentate CA3, and let's take older and younger individuals here and just say this happens to be actually in the Ray Vault, uh, and look at the um, NDI having done a sort of a global regression pulling out global changes in anything like that. You can see that there is a nice relationship and you run some form of uh, you know, <clears throat> a model here on this. 
excuse me, you run a fairly standard sort of model on it. <clears throat> and yes, there are a couple statistical assumptions in this kind of modeling that are not actually valid in this approach, but our idea was simply to try to see how is this variance structure working because you have age and age is correlated with the NDI inside of the dentate and age is also correlated with the memory ability. But what is the statistical correlational structure like this looking like? And what you find is that the model that comes out is that age leads to a change in your dentate NDI, which leads to a change in your memory ability. It's not that age is directly going to the memory ability. So we can reject that other that other style of model. So if you want the details on that kind of thing, we can go and take a look at the uh, you can go and take a look at the paper a little bit later. OK, so this is starting to then push that idea that, well, maybe it really is age related changes in the hippocampus that is driving some of this memory for the detail kind of loss here. And the technique in this case here was using diffusion MR. We've done some functional MR as well. But the other technique that we've really been starting to try to develop a lot more on in the lab is spectroscopy. And what I'm going to be showing you today is some work from uh, hydrogen based single voxel spectroscopy in the hippocampus. We're doing a good amount with uh, CSI slice style imaging, and we're just now starting to do some phosphorus and some carbon based MR spectroscopy as well. Okay, so but fewer of you will have done a whole heck of a lot with spectroscopy. So let me give you the overview as to how that works. The basic idea is take some hunk of brain or any tissue. We're going to use brain obviously here. So here I've gone and taken a little hunk of the hippocampus. There will be various, well, there'll be various chemical compounds inside of here. Um, so for example, there'll be a number of brain metabolites. And we'll take something like uh, NAA, a uh, neuronal marker here, and yeah, we've got hydrogen. You know, you'll take something like myoinositol, and again, you've got hydrogens, of course, scattered all around here. You can take something like glutamate and glutamine. You can take a number of different things here, choline, creatine. They all have a chemical structure to them. And of course, in MRI, what we're listening to the vast, vast majority of time is the resonance spectrum of hydrogen. You're made up of a ton of water. It's one good reason why we use hydrogen. So you lie inside the scanner, we get you going at that Larmor frequency and the Larmor frequency of hydrogen, and we go and we listen to the resonance spectrum that you have coming out of that. In all MR, we're doing that. But here in MR spectroscopy, we're paying a lot of detail to the actual shape of that spectrum. Because when you have hydrogen in this chemical composition versus in this one versus in this one, you've got different things hanging off it, so you're going to have a different resonance to it. And we can know a priori. Hey, wait a minute here. NAA, well, it looks like this purple line. It's got a little bit of squiggly stuff here, and it's got this big, nice, clean resonance there, and there you go. Choline, creatine, glutamate glutamine complex, GLX, each one of these guys has its own fingerprint resonance spectrum. So if you get something coming out of the scanner here, like this little, you know, black fuzzy line along there, you can go and take a set of basis functions, compounds you think may be in there, and you can go and solve and say how much of each one of these, basically in a big multiple regression, how much of each one of these exists. So we can then go and quantify these. And we can then say, how does that change with X? And it gives us a way of trying to get closer to the underlying neurobiology of what may actually be going on. So what do we see? Well, uh, this is the work of uh, uh, Jessica Lingad in, uh, in the lab. And what you can see is that, for example, inside of the hippocampus here, um, we can see that there is an increase in the GLX levels in the hippocampus uh, as you age here. And we also see that there's an increase in myonositol levels. And again, there's that notion that the hippocampus is firing more. There's this hyperactivity in the hippocampus. This may be that. And I say may for a number of reasons. We still have to have a, um, some other work that goes on to really try to hammer down whether this is truly tied to that. And one of the big things is separating glutamate and glutamine. But we also see this increase in myonositol, and myonositol has been used for a number of years as a marker of neuroinflammation. It's not a perfect one, but it definitely is correlated with neuroinflammation. We're doing some work right now to try to hone in on exactly what we're getting out of that. But not only do you see that there's an increase in these kinds of things with age, but again, we can take a standardized test like the Rayvault, use that very often because it's nice and standardized, and you can see that yes, in fact, for example, that's correlated, negatively correlated with your myonositol. 
And again, if you're actually talking about the fact that people are aging and maybe they're even getting into MCI here and that may be leading to some form of whether it's neurodegeneration going on inside of here, whether it's something a bit more subtle, but it's still leading to an inflammatory response. Again, if you're having more of that, you'd be doing worse on the ray fault. So that makes some good sense there. It's the work that we're just trying to uh, pull together right now. Okay, so from the first part of the talk here, uh, this is the kind of thing that I would often give and I would extend out with some more details and more studies and it's all really, really great stuff. And it's the kind of thing that I've been doing for years and kind of similar things that a lot of you folks have been doing for years of being able to really characterize all the things that are going wrong in the system. You know, but I would always get the question, can we do anything about this or is it just basically like it's all downhill from pick your inflection point, whether it's 20 or 40s or 60s or 80s, there are probably multiple inflection points down here on different aspects of it. Are we just out of luck or is there anything we can do? And so one of the great things about academia is that every once in a while you can decide to shift gears and do something a little bit different. So we did that. So take home from part one is that yes, our memory ability does decline with age, it declines in specific ways. The hippocampus is at least one component of this kind of thing and there are specific things going on in here. We should pay attention to the animal models. They do look a whole heck of a lot like that. So what might we be able to do? Okay, well, here's one idea. It's by no means the only kind of thing that we could do, but we decided to explore this notion of environmental enrichment because it's really easy. So environmental enrichment in the rodent refers to this basic phenomenon. If you take a uh, mice and you house them, what they call the standard environment, so you'll have a handful of them, say four of them per box there, versus you house them in an enriched environment. And here enrichment is you give them things to explore, you'll give them an exercise wheel, you give them some toys, you still have hanging out with your mouse buddies and all that kind of thing, but now there's some stuff to do. If you do this very simple manipulation, a whole bunch of things go on inside the brain. And I do want to say a whole bunch of things go on inside the brain. One of the things that goes on inside the brain is an increase in hippocampal neurogenesis. Neurogenesis, the birth of new neurons in the adult brain, happens in only two places, your olfactory bulb and the dentate gyrus of your hippocampus where this pattern separation is ostensibly going on. We can see that doing this gives you more neurons and even more the amount of exploration that the rats do. Not just the amount of walking around in this, but the amount of actually visiting different places inside of here, what they call cumulative roaming entropy, which is really just Shannon information on their motion. The amount that they're moving around and exploring different things within the same strain of mouse correlates with the number of new adult-born neurons. Okay, and lots of fun work going on in the mouse in terms of what actually increases this, what other things go on like BDNF levels, a lot of great stuff here. The story I'm about to tell doesn't rely on this being adult neurogenesis or not, but it's one way to think about it. Okay, so those are mice, environmental enrichment, that's cool, but you may be saying to yourself, come on, I mean, we live in enriched worlds. We don't live in these little, at least pre-COVID, you know, in the before times, that great time, we lived in these enriched kind of things. We would go around, we would do stuff, and and we lead pretty enriched lives. And besides, how are we really going to test something like that in people? You know, um, I could do something like this. This would be the direct analogy. I could do something like this is Epic Sky Park, uh, Castle Rock Epic Sky Tour. Um, and go and have my participants go and climb around these jungle gyms. Now, you try doing that with an 80-year-old and getting the insurance to cover that, that's not going to happen. Likewise, sending them out orienteering with GPS things. Actually, we did something almost like this in 70 and 80-year-olds. Uh, it wasn't orienteering, it's in a park. I'll tell you about that one in a little bit. But again, having them get lost, this is just not really a good idea. I totally wish I could take credit for this idea. This was a really, really clever idea. Uh, all credit goes to Dane Clemenson, who was a uh, postdoc in my lab at the time. He had done his PhD with Rusty Gage doing the effects of environmental enrichment in mice and wanted to transition into working in humans. And he said, it's like, you know, we could do this environmental enrichment <clears throat> using off the shelf commercial video games. And that's why I'm using this background. Um, people pay to do this. You grab a controller or keyboard and mouse and you go and you explore these worlds and they are incredibly rich 
world and engaging. And you have engineers and computer scientists and artists and all sorts of things trying to make a really, really rich experience, a wonderfully detailed world that you will enjoy going in and exploring and you will pay money and spend lots of time even on your own to do it and to have this be a really, really rich experience. They're out there. They're off the shelf. Why go and try to build your own one as a scientist, which will probably look really lame when these things exist? So maybe it would be the case that we could use off the shelf video games as environmental enrichment and that would improve your memory enough for us to be able to see. OK, so. I heard this idea and I said there's absolutely no way this is going to work. There's absolutely no way that this is possibly going to work. But here I got a I got a postdoc in the lab and he needs to learn that you don't pick up humans by their tails and drop them in. You need to learn how to do human research and stuff. And so sure, you know, I got a free postdoc from a grant kind of thing. Go on, go test it. We'll see something like, I don't know, we'll survey, we'll ask how the kinds of video games you play, how much, we'll give him our mnemonic similarity task and at least to learn how to do some human research and then we'll move on to something real. Here's the graph. Performance on our lure discrimination index, that ability, that really hippocampal dependence sort of aspect on all of this, and non-gamers did a whole heck of a lot worse than gamers on this task. Okay. Um, that's good, but I mean, really, I mean, come on. I mean, what's the, yeah, and by the way, the complexity of the game that they play actually correlates with how well they perform on our task. That's still something, but I mean, look, maybe these are just the cool kids. These are the ones who are eating paste in kindergarten or something like that. You know, really, I still didn't like remotely believe this when when Dane showed me the graph. Yeah, I mean, the data are the data, but I mean, is it really? Uh, OK, so we said, let's go and try to move this ourselves. So we did a little small little trial, about 75 people, non gamers, uh, and we brought these uh, folks in. We, they get a pretest of the mnemonic of the MST, they get a post test, and two weeks later they get another post test. <clears throat> we had three uh, controls, sorry, three groups that we randomly assigned folks to a no game control, so this is a no contact control condition. And then we had two gaming conditions in which they would play for a half hour a day for two weeks. One version of this, we picked Super Mario 3D World. Super Mario 3D World we picked because, look, kids can do it, so these are non gamers. They're coming on in, they're learning how to do this kind of thing, and it's a 3D setup. It's pretty simple, but there's a lot of information inside of here. As you're navigating in 3D, there's tons of spatial relations you get automatically. There are complex maps and everything here that you're going through. And if the hippocampus is doing the automatic encoding of attended experience, Richard Morris, pretty good guess as to what it's doing here, it should be engaged in that kind of thing. We also had a gaming, a sort of active control condition of angry birds. So you pull the bird back and you shoot it into a tower of piggies and you try to knock it all down. I do want to pause here for just a moment and say that some of my colleagues get to do things like, ah, uh, well, we were looking at the phosphorylation levels of this after we injected a basal protein to, and then I get to say that my conditions are, you played Angry Birds or Super Mario 3D World, and I have to try to say this with a straight face. One way I can do that is it worked. It worked phenomenally. So here, these are then those three groups. By the way, this is a 2015 Jane Neurosci paper. So here's the MST performance in the no game control in green. We test you before, we test you after, we test you at the delay. It is perfectly flat. It's a great thing about the MST. There really aren't much in the way of practice effects. If you did uh, Angry Birds, again, nothing. But if you played Super Mario 3D World, you increased from baseline. And in this uh, two-week condition here, this uh, was higher than those. You got better on our task that has nothing to do with plumbers and mushrooms and stuff. So that's transfer. We're getting transfer on memory performance after playing a video game for a half hour a day for two weeks which by the way seems to stay elevated here for the two week washout period. By the way, the recognition bit on that didn't change at all and shouldn't change at all. Huh, okay, I'm starting to believe this, but you may be saying to yourself, I mean, really, seriously, seriously, playing Super Mario 3D like makes your memory better and you're, no, really, this has gotta be some kind of a fluke. All right, well, even if it's not a fluke here, uh, 
Yeah, that study was done in college undergraduates here. This is supposed to be a talk on aging. Could this actually do anything in aging populations? And what would it be about the game that might actually be doing this? And are there any actual changes in the brain? So let me see if I can take these on here. OK, first off, let's replicate it and take it into aging. So what we did in this case here, these are then folks in their uh, uh, 70s and 80s. And we said, OK, look, we're now going to do uh, basically the same setup. We're going to make a couple small changes. One change is we're going to extend this for four weeks instead of two weeks, figuring also there's going to be some time for them to learn even how to play the game and this kind of thing. We're also, instead of a no contact control, we're going to do a sort of a, a low level control here and that they all had a computer of some sort and we would install Solitaire on their computer. It's our own version of Solitaire here, so it's a new game that they're learning how to do. Um, but we did Angry Birds, Super Mario 3D World, and we also then had a four week washout period to try to just sort of extend it. All right, so uh, that's the basic task design here. Uh, these are all healthy older adults, screened to be a healthy older adults. What happens in this? Let me show you these two lines first. Our solitaire group, pretty much nothing. Statistically, this is nice and flat. Our Super Mario 3D, they get better. Not a Super Mario task, yeah, they get better at that, but they get better at our memory task outside of any of this kind of thing as we probe them throughout. All right, now, I'm hiding the blue line, the Angry Birds line, and I'm hiding it intentionally. So when we started this, and yes, we even have a grant we can point to to say that, hey, this may be the case. Um, when we started this, we said, that Angry Birds group, you're like 75. We show up to your house with a big flat screen TV and a Wii U, and we teach you how to play Angry Birds. This isn't the same as a 19-year-old learning how to play Angry Birds. This is really pretty new stuff to them. They've never held a controller. They've never seen these games. Oh my gosh, you're kidding me. I'm, oh wow, when I get to, oh, and I, oh, ah, okay. All of those kinds of things are going on as you're learning how to do this. Now the world is a lot smaller. It's a lot less, but probably be some amount of enrichment, wouldn't it? It's kind of an enriching experience, maybe a bit less. So it might lead to, oh, I don't know, an intermediate kind of effect. So here statistically what we found is that it jumped up in the first two weeks and it seemed to pretty much flatten out after that. All right, so we can see it again and we can see it in older folks. Now let me try to get at some how reliable is this and a little bit also about what is it about the game. Let me take this complex graph that shows you all sort of of the full trajectory and let me just turn it into a difference. The difference, the pre post, forget the washout, forget the curve in the middle. Let's just do the pre post difference here and come up and turn this into a bar graph. And I'm going to color code these bar graphs. I'm about to show you a big nasty looking slide. I'm going to color code these bar graphs so that gray is always our sort of lowest level kind of control. Blue is kind of an intermediate level of enrichment and red then is our highest level of enrichment. In the form of how complex is the game and that kind of thing here. So these are then those data from the older individuals and I could do something like say, OK, here are then the young individuals. This is that J Neuro 2015 paper and these are the data that I just showed you in older adults with those same three games. And you can see there's a dose dependent effect really then in each one of them. All right. Other study. This study said, OK, what is it about the game? We took young individuals, we had them play Minecraft and we could do things like give them a totally barren world with a, a box full of goodies and say, just go build whatever you feel like. But there's no exploration. There's no nothing And people kind of got, well, a little bit of lack of engagement in terms of what they were building. They built a house and then did a little bit and yeah. We could also do things like give them a barren looking world, but teach them how to then go and build really, really complex structures so that each time we're pushing them to do more and more and learn how to do more and more complex things inside of Minecraft. That worked. Or just have them go and have the normal Minecraft world and explore and try to get back home each day. Explore this rich environment. That worked. And if you have them do this free exploration for a while, then have to go and harvest the resources to build complex things. Yeah, that, uh, that seems to be the highest kind of level here. We get what looks to be a dose dependent effect. We can also do this kind of thing in middle aged individuals. This is running right now. This is data from the first batch, a before times batch, and we're now running an after times batch or during times uh, batch. But we were seeing in middle aged individuals and 40 to 49 year olds in which we could run at least three of these conditions here. Um, we didn't have the funding to run the fourth condition. In any case, we're again seeing that this seems to be having an effect. And by the way, if you notice in each of these, I've scaled these, these are all the same y axis. We're getting the same effect size 
over and over and over and over again. So it doesn't even have to be a game. I mentioned before orienteering in old adults. This is 65 to 89 year olds. And what we did is we made a little smartphone app for them and we had them go to a park that they didn't know, but we had already figured out a whole bunch of locations inside of that park. And so the smartphone app would say, hey, go find this little thing. Maybe it's a letter H from some sign. Like, I don't, I don't know where the heck that is. I'll just start walking. You're getting warmer, you're getting colder, you're getting warmer, warmer. Oh, there it is, Ka-ching. got it. Here's another one, here's another one, here's another one. We had 20 different locations in the park. Each day they would do a dozen of them randomly selected. After a week, shoot them to a different park, a different park, a different park. You do that, this real world scavenger hunt boosts it just the same. And again, in our low level control here, nothing going on. All right. So in each of these conditions here, this lore discrimination kind of thing is improving. And in each one of these things here, the recognition is doing absolutely nothing. It's not moving. Again, suggesting that it may actually be this. And so this is five out of five studies and about 300 participants have shown this effect. So I don't think it's a fluke. All right, the brain. <sighs> okay, um, here's then the, the data that I'd shown you before from, from Hamzi, showing that aging is leading to an increase in this NDI value inside of the dentate CA3 of the hippocampus. These are unpublished data. Uh, I want to see it a second time to actually believe it enough myself, um, and we just don't have the data on this. This is actually from that scavenger hunt task. We had enough data inside of here, but I want to see this a second time. I need to internally replicate it before I'm going to publish, publish it. Um, we saw actually a decrease in this hippocampal NDI. So as if aging cross-sectionally is leading to an increase, but then interventionally here pre-post, you're dropping this NDI having done that scavenger hunt task. Again, I want to see this again before I truly believe it and go out and, uh, and actually try to publish it there, because to me, that's the, that's the big gigantic claim. Okay, so really, is it a fluke? Doesn't seem to be a fluke. It does seem to work five out of five times. It's worked in young adults, it's worked in middle-aged adults, it's worked in older adults. It seems to be novelty, learning new things, and spatial exploration is just a really, really good, easy way of getting that because whenever you're walking around, there are tons of these spatial relations that you're coming up with. Automatically encoding it seems to be a good way of doing it here, and at least we're seeing some promising signs of changes in the brain as a result of all of that. Okay, so take home a part two here. These large immersive commercial 3D video games provide a form of environmental enrichment. Sure seems to be that way, and can improve hippocampal function and memory. But of course, it doesn't have to actually just be, you know, a video game. That's an easy way to do this, sure. But there will certainly be times in which that's limiting or that's just not your jam. Yeah, you can do something like that, but you can also go and I haven't tested this, but I would sort of bet that if you're really pushing yourself and trying to learn truly new things out of a book, that should work. This guy here, by the way, a Yangi uh, Mingo Rinpoche, he's a Tibetan monk who actually grew up in caves and actually knows his neuroscience and can write books with chapters on LTP and everything on it and how that actually relates to meditation and, it's, and, the Buddha, and Buddhism. It's actually pretty cool. It's a fun book. You can do things like go and listen to talks. Maybe you learned a thing or two from my public ones. They tend to have some more novelty out of what I'm saying here. But any of these things we think would actually be doing that. So we obviously don't know for sure, but that's also where like other folks can come on and actually try to do it. But the idea is it seems to be this novelty, but you may have to be doing that quite a bunch. Okay, so let me give you the acknowledgements here and then open it up for questions. Um, I've been trying to give the shout outs along the way uh, as to folks like Dane and Jess and Hamzi and everything here. Everything was done with my longtime collaborator and colleague, Shauna Stark. Um, also a team, of course, of undergraduate researchers who've been helping out in the lab for the years. If you want to see then, there are some uh, a sort of fun video version of the video game stuff done. It's on uh, YouTube on Minefield, um, Your Brain on Tech uh, by Michael Stevens or Vsauce. Uh, work was funded by the N, uh, by the NIH and by the Dana Foundation. And with that, let me open it up to some questions. Thanks very much, uh, Craig. Uh, tremendous, uh, uh, great talk, and uh, beautifully timed. 
So uh, we have a couple of questions relating to the video game work. So let me just um, start with those. Uh, the first of these questions uh, is essentially about uh, what constitutes the control condition. So um, there was, the, as a, the questioner says, yes, there was a no game control. This is presumably related to your first um, study. Mm -hmm. But the, the more general issue is um, uh, how were videoed spatial details of the video games controlled across the different conditions? Right. Uh, so, for example, I, uh, I guess if you think um, solitaire is not as challenging attentionally and visually, for example, I guess, as Super Mario. So how do you, I guess what the, um, the questioner is getting at is how do you unpack what the different demands of the task might be that give rise to these effects? Yeah, exactly. Great question, and I have um, a couple answers to it. I'm gonna give the snarky answer first, and I'm prefacing it that way because it is the, the snarky answer, but there's a reason why I'm gonna give it here. The snarky answer is, who cares? All right, so if we're getting an effect here, that's something big to know in and of itself. So by playing these games, you're having an effect on memory. And if we can establish and accept that, that we've moved the ball forward and that's pretty darn cool. And then the next thing is, oh, okay, now let's go and try to pick apart what it is. The scientist, of course, wants to be able to say, what is it? That's why I say it's the, the sort of the snarky answer mm -hmm. and everything in there. Sure. So our best bet at getting at that has actually been here inside of inside of Minecraft. And so one of the things that we wanted to do is pick out within the game what is it. Now, in a lot of these things, we still don't have control over a lot of the game environment. And one of the temptations among researchers is to do that reductionist approach and turn it into a very lean, tight kind of thing. And, oh, let me now just have more contrast or higher spatial frequency detail versus less or something like that. We run the risk in this of, of throwing the baby out with the bathwater in that we want to then have that. If we think that that real richness of the experience is driving it, we need to embed that richness in, which then does make controlling all of these other factors that much more challenging. But in this one here, all right, in this one here, the free building has a barren world, but that you are building something inside of it, a big house and all that kind of thing. And certainly when you're inside the house, you have all sorts of visuospatial detail and all that kind of deal. Um, and it did absolutely nothing in these 20 year olds. Now, if we go and we have that same barren world, but we're teaching you how to build something in there that again is sort of like the house, but now we're teaching you how to use redstone or how to do a more complex kind of build, that does have an effect. Okay, likewise, if you're navigating in a rich world that has trees and lakes and all that kind of thing as you're running around in Minecraft, that has an effect even without the building. And when you both of them, it seems to then have, seems to, this was not statistically additive, but it seems to then be, you know, an additive kind of effect, at least trending mm -hmm. in that direction. Sure. So this is the sort of spot where we have the best way of getting okay. at that, because you're right, comparing across the games is going to be notoriously difficult that way. Mm -hmm. But I do like to keep up that answer of saying, we need to keep in mind what is our end goal. And one end goal is to figure out scientifically what it is about the task. The other end goal is, I just need an effect. Mm -hmm. If I'm bleeding, I don't need to know about different clotting factors and factor nine and platelets and all that kind of stuff. I need to know that if you go like this and you mm -hmm. elevate it, I don't die. So it's kind of fun to sort of bounce back and forth between those two different, uh, two different worlds. But as I say, we shouldn't lose sight of the fact just because we don't understand the mechanisms of why. And I don't know if it's BDNF or Vega for neurogenesis or something totally different. OK, thank you. Uh, another couple of questions. Uh, one here from Denise. Uh, she would like to know how many participants you had in each condition in the um, in the aging studies. Yeah. And, al so, and also what do you think you were controlling for with the solitaire condition? Yeah, so the uh, ends in each of these are in the um, 25 to 30 
Uh, I can't believe I can't remember the exact numbers, but they're in the 25 to 30 kind of range here. They are not gigantic studies. We just had a grant went, that went through that we were trying to then go and boost this up and also do some things in the novelty dosing. Like what if you play the same game for two months versus one month of a game and then shift to a different game, et cetera, et cetera. What do we think we're controlling in the solitaire condition? Uh, the solitaire folks still actually thought that we were doing something to them. Um, and so we didn't want just a straight no contact control uh, because there was still sort of the belief in our participants that doing something like playing solitaire is like keeping their mind engaged and alert and all mm -hmm. that kind of thing. Sure. We've switched over to, to Sudoku uh, for this for our future plans. Uh, again, yes, there are differences in this, but it's trying to then control for thinking that they are in a study and doing something. Fair enough. At the same time, it's not then trying to get at the same richness of the experience that you have in the others. I understand. Very good. Thank you. Uh, and this is a question I have a cynical suspicion it might be from an enthusiastic gamer, but that may just be an unfair comment on my part. What kind of an impact do you think it would have on the brain if the individual spend more than eight hours playing these yeah. games yeah. every day? So, <laughs> and, and so the word, when I give this talk to like public thing, parents are like, um, my kid's going to love you. And I turn around and say to them, it's like, yeah, and this is a half hour a day. So this to me is one of the gigantic questions. What is the dosing effect on this? Mm -hmm. Have I saturated out at a half hour a day? What if I do five hours, 10 hours? Is at some point here it gets to be a deleterious kind of thing because you really are doing the same thing over and over again and you're not having other experiences in life. So you've really kind of traded the potential novelty of the video game world for now that's just your world and you're living inside of it and kind of what's the difference between mm -hmm. that and yeah. yeah. Okay, so... I don't know. We did well on this grant, but it didn't get funded. Um, but these are some of the questions I truly, truly want to have. And in all of this, right, we're not in like the hard, hardcore gaming kind of uh, kind of realm. And so it's really then about this idea of trying to get something new into your world. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, so I, I have one question, if I may, um, which you've heard me ask you before, uh, uh, related to the first part of the talk. And in particular, the relative role of changes in the hippocampus as we grow older to changes in the rest of the brain. Yeah. And, ha and how that mediates um, memory decline. So without any disrespect or any casting any aspersion over the your work on hippocampal mechanisms, um, how do you see that in relation to other kinds of changes in other regions of the brain, which are probably also uh, also contributing to decline in episodic memory, not in yeah. recognition memory, not yep. familiarity driven memory. So just to give one example, as, as you know, we've shown that um, the uh, low fidelity with which older people sometimes reinstate episodic memories, reactivate uh, re episodic memory in the cortex mm -hmm. uh, can be is entirely explained by the low selectivity or the low fidelity with which they represent that information at the time that they're encoding it. Right. In other words, if we if we control for the selectivity with which people are um, representing, for example, scene information as they study it, we eliminate age differences in the uh, selectivity of the reactivation of that information at, at the time of retrieval. Yeah. Um, that so there, there are a couple, about, you know, couple garbage things, in, garbage out. Yeah. There are a couple things on that. So first off, of course, what really is needed is the big grand, you know, set of studies to to try to unite all of this and be able to have all of that shared variance. And part of what I've been trying to do is to get the hippocampus back on the table because uh, for a good number of years it was swept off the table and be able to say, no, 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 we do really need to think about this. But if we come back even to this task right here, to the MST, there are two really, really interesting data points to me that, that speak to this. First data point is that if I do the MST here, not as a study test, but I do it in an immediate fashion. So I'll give you like this four leaf clover and then a noise mask a varying number of seconds here. And then I give you that four leaf clover or a different one. Uh, and I just say, is this the same exact thing that you've seen? Yes or no. So I'm getting the immediate memory. I'm getting the perceptual thing. I'm getting what would be encoded into your longer term memory and all of that. 
zero effect of aging on it whatsoever. Now, all of our folks have corrected vision. We know that if you don't have corrected vision, there was a study out there that showed that, yeah, you have a tough time on that task if you're, you know, at 20, 100 or something like that. Absolutely. Um, but in all of our studies, we have that, we have the acuity checks, and then we've seen that it doesn't happen in the immediate condition. We've also seen that if you take participants and we've tried some of these things where we said, here is what we are going to do. I am going to show you this and later on show you this. And you have to say, no, 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 no. It's not the same darn picnic basket. All right. That's what I'm about to do to you. OK, you got it. Now let's go and do it. No improvement whatsoever. The aging effect is there. It's just as robust. In fact, it doesn't move at all. And one of the key things on this is that the great thing about this task is that the way in which we change the stimuli in these lures varies all over the place. So there isn't a nice mnemonic strategy you can use on that to try to help out. So yes, there absolutely 100% are other things going on. And take something like the Ray Vault. The Ray Vault is a, in many ways, a much better test of age-related memory impairments than my MST is. Because if you're having hippocampal things or you're having frontal things, you're gonna have problems on the Ray Vault, you know? Or if you're able to use some cool strategy to be able to then go and help prop up your failing declarative -y, whatever the heck you wanna call it system, hey, you're going to be able to get through life perfectly fine right now on a whole bunch of reasons because then you can use some strategies to get around that. So I think absolutely I'm in 100% agreement. Both uh, All of these things are going on inside there, and I do want us to have big, great study to sort of rule them all. I don't know what that study is, um, but I know that in, in our hands with this task, we cannot push around the aging effect. We had a 2015 paper, which we tried four or five different ways of, of trying to see, could we make that go away? And the only way we could make it go away was to cheat and say that, okay, tell us, yes, you've seen it before, if it's an exact repetition or if it's just a similar thing. Well, yeah, I took away the task. And if you do that, they're fine. Mm -hmm. And if you don't do that, then then they still have that same exact size memory. Fair enough. OK, thank you. Thanks very much. So I agree. I think the we need, a, as you say, one study to rule them all. Perhaps we, yeah. should, uh, we should talk about this offline, about whether we can do something. Yep. So um, there, there are no more questions um, and we are out of time. Uh, I, I hope everyone will jo join me in virtually applauding uh, a superbly clear and Fascinating talk from Craig. You got us off to a great start for this semester, Craig. Um, tremendous. You've set a, a good bar for the rest of our speakers. And uh, let me wish you on behalf of CVL and our audience um, the best of your research going forward and I hope that you stay well until you get the vaccine in your arm. Excellent. So, Thank you all so much. Bye for now, Craig. <laughs>